tonight. Hope for the future as James Smith Cree Nation celebrates a new educational partnership. You can tell like he wants attention. The Regina Humane Society rescues 26 dogs living in awful conditions. Plus, a 10-year-old Martinsville boy is one of the best in the world, qualifying for the Braille Challenge Finals in California. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Thursday, May 23rd, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. The city of Regina will indeed bail out two of its municipal corporations who need to pay back millions to the federal government. City Council voted unanimously Wednesday night to provide Regina Exhibition Association Limited, or REAL, and Economic Development Regina with $8.7 million. The money will pay back pandemic wage subsidies that were accessed during the COVID-19 pandemic. An audit by the Canadian Revenue Agency found the two corporations weren't eligible for those subsidies. Council made it clear that some people might feel frustrated with this decision. Frankly, I don't think there's one member of council or any member of the public who would like to pay this money back to the Canada Revenue Agency for programs that they designed for COVID relief. Um, but the reality is, um, if we were going to leave those doors open at real, and we did, we made that decision, um, council could have inter intervened at any point in time, and we didn't because we understand the community benefit to that site. If council had decided against helping, the city would have had to take on debt to pay back the federal government. That's because their debt is guaranteed by the city of Regina. And the organizations aren't making enough money to pay it back on their own. Wednesday's decision may have saved the city from making a more expensive decision and payment in the future. Today was one for celebration at James Smith Cree Nation. A new educational partnership is finally underway. And as Pratush Dial reports, students and educators are hoping it will bring better and more culturally appropriate education to the community. East Central First Nations Education Partnership had its grand official opening at Bernard Constant Community School in James Smith Cree Nation. Students say they feel hopeful again. It's been less than two years since Canada's worst mass stabbing that saw 11 people being killed and 17 injured in James Smith Cree Nation and the nearby community of Weldon. It has been a really rough two years for the community. The partnership will bring more staff to the school and opportunities for students. It's also bringing new courses such as land-based education. We learn about our culture and stuff like making fires or you know, making tents with only resources that we're limited to. They take us out to go learn about the land uh, activities like fishing. The wellness room has been a really good addition to our school because it's a lot more easier knowing we can take a break and go talk to someone without having to sit here all day and worry. The director of education at the partnership says there are better educational standards and more students enrolled now. Canada did uh, provide this opportunity for First Nations to uh, walk down this road. And so James Smith took that opportunity and today now um, we've walked through that door. The chief of James Smith Cree Nation says this can be replicated as a model in other First Nations. We were always living on the land. And that's where all of our teachings are come from, is from the land. And bringing those back into the school and to mainstream uh, education right now is a big improvement from when, when I first went to school. Because I went to school here as well, and I graduated here. And we never had this uh, land-based training that we have now. Constance says this new curriculum has been a long time coming. And he says he hopes the young students here now will learn traditions, history and culture. They will pass down to their own children. Pratish Tayal, CBC News, James Smith Cree Nation. There's a new option for health care that will soon serve northern communities. The new Indigenous-led virtual health hub is being built on the White Cap Dakota First Nation. The facility is a collaboration with the Saskatchewan Indian Institute of Technologies, the first of its kind in Canada. It will be supported by USASC's College of Medicine. Once up and running in 2026, the new centre will serve up to 30 communities remotely using robotic ultrasonography. 
from White Caps' perspective, you know, we've uh, as a, the, the word Dakota actually means ally. And so we've always, uh, everything, everything you see inside our community here, even the 800 jobs we have, is all about partnership and working together. And so it, it became one of those things where just uh, creating that friendship with Dr. Mendez, understanding the work he was doing, and understanding the fact that it was going to change the way we deliver health care, more efficient, more effective health care. About a dozen students at a time will learn virtual health care skills at the hub, and then they'll set up the technology in rural remote communities, creating jobs and decreasing, decreasing patient travel. The virtual health care can be used by anyone, Indigenous or not, and the federal government will pay for two-thirds of the cost. The province will cover the rest. YWCA Regina is turning to the public for support, short on money, for its new women and children's centre. Construction is well underway at the site. The pieces are coming together on this new building. And soon, it will be home to emergency shelter spaces and supportive housing units for women and kids in crisis. It will also include a community hub of services and programs like daycare, cultural supports, and a low-cost grocery store. However, some of these programs could be at risk if they can't raise enough money. The YWCA asked the provincial government for help, but the province rejected their request. We still have 4.5 million uh, left to raise um, and 13 weeks until construction time is complete. And, uh, and so we had an ask into the provincial government for $5 million in addition to the six that they had already given us to help us get to that end at budget time. Unfortunately, that wasn't realized. Um, and so we were back in the community again, um, asking people to help us get to that finish line. The YWCA did budget for inflation, but construction costs jumped far beyond what they anticipated. The facility was supposed to cost $54 million to build, but the price tag has risen to $70 million. Saskatchewan teachers have about a week to decide if they want to sign a proposed contract ag agreement. The Teachers Federation held two town halls this week to bring forward a proposal that they're backing. It follows teachers overwhelmingly rejecting the previously proposed agreement after months of intermittent job action. The current agreement includes changes to address classroom complexity, unlike the previous proposal. It promises a ministerial task force to compose a report that looks at the current situation and schools and identifies solutions. So this is, in my mind, a positive step forward and a change of course from this government where uh, these are, uh, are commitments that are being made to start addressing um, classroom complexity and the challenges that students and teachers face uh, in schools across the province. Um, it's not a solution. There's still lots of work that needs to be done. Teachers will vote Wednesday and Thursday of next week. The final results are expected Thursday night, a week from today. Is it time to change the name of Regina's Dubny Avenue? It's a question that's been asked for years, and soon it will be up for debate at City Council. Alexander Kwan brings us that story. Dubny Avenue runs east to west through Regina. And right now, it's a hotbed of construction. While it's getting a facelift, is it time for a new name? Advocates have been calling for it for years. The only thing that I have is perseverance, right? And so whether it was a past mayor or whether it's this mayor, you know, I, I'm going to can still continue. And change could be on the horizon. At least two city councillors say it's time to have a tough discussion about Dudney Avenue and its namesake, Lord Edgar Dudney. That's why they're bringing a motion to city council. It feels like unfinished business, so we ought to do it. It's, it's totally improper to have a major street in Regina named after an open settler colonialist racist. Edgar Dudney was the commissioner of Indian Affairs and lieutenant governor of the Northwest Territories in the late 1800s. He helped set up Canada's reserve system. He starved Indigenous communities by withholding food and rations. And Dudney also helped establish the Indian residential school system. The city has already acknowledged the name Dudney is problematic. Thanks to the efforts of people like Joe Lee Big Eagle Coquitaway, the city stripped Dudney's name from a pool and park in the city's north central neighborhood. It's now named Buffalo Meadows Park and Pool. It was an easier um, decision to make because it didn't impact that many people, whereas Dudney, changing Dudney Avenue will cause some effects within the community, you know, but I think that that's a good thing. It's not clear how councillors will vote, and Regina Mayor Sandra Masters is not showing her hand. It is one of our longest roads in the city, and there's 
2,500 businesses and residents that are on that street, and then you know balancing that against you know you know some of the folks who um, who are looking at the name itself of the individual, Lord Dudney himself. The renaming motion is set to be debated next month. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. The Regina Humane Society is working to bring a pack of dogs found in deplorable conditions back to health. Last week, someone reported dogs and puppies living in crowded housing. When animal enforcement arrived, they found 17 adult dogs and nine puppies. The animals were dirty and sick, and many of them were injured, likely due to fighting. Ten of them had to be put down due to extreme injuries. The Humane Society says the dogs were living in terrible conditions for a long time. All of them were, were covered in feces and dirt and urine. Uh, in, in some cases, the, their coats were actually stained yellow, um, some on their legs, some on their, their hind legs, and some almost their entire body from lying in urine for, for so long. And that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, that happens after an extended period of time. The Humane Society is now working with the dogs so they can start trusting humans. This involves spending time with the Humane Society workers, playing with toys and going for walks. Thorne says the remaining dogs have been named after gemstones because they are precious. He added two of the rescue dogs have already been adopted and he's hopeful the rest will find a forever home soon. As for the owner, we're told they may be charged, but that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Well, this was the site in Moose Jaw yesterday. Fans up bright and early, lining Manitoba Street as the Warriors started their trek to Saginaw, Michigan. That's where the WHL champions will play in the 2024 Memorial Cup. The Warriors' first game is the Round Robin against the host team tomorrow at 5.30. They then play again on Monday and Tuesday for sure. The rest depends on how they do. The championship final is on Sunday, June 2nd. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. The Saskatoon portion of the Rough Riders training camp is almost over. The team held its final full day of practice at Griffith Stadium today. A walkthrough is scheduled for tomorrow morning before the team heads to Edmonton for Saturday's second and final preseason game. Head coach Corey May says he's made some adjustments throughout camp, including how practice is structured. For example, today I didn't have them in pads, but I feel like we just didn't really have enough practices in pads, and I think the guys were kind of itching for it. So we put them on today, even though we're a couple game, a couple days out from the game, and really that just you know a test: can we get a can we get a good physical practice while also being smart as a professional? And I thought we did that for the most part, so I was pleased with today's practice. Saturday afternoon's game against the Elks is scheduled for two o'clock. The Riders will then head to Regina for the last week of camp before making final cuts. The Rough Riders regular season starts June 8th back in Edmonton. It was a day of Canadian sports history as the Women's National Basketball Association officially announced its anticipated expansion into Toronto and the man heading it up has high hopes for it. First and foremost, this franchise will be Canada's team. While our home base will be here, right here, Coca-Cola Coliseum, an exhibition place in Toronto, we will play games in Vancouver and Montreal throughout the season, uniting the country behind our franchise. Tenenbaum's Kilmer Group will own the team. He's also chairman of the company owning Toronto's Raptors and Maple Leafs. Also on hand, the Prime Minister, Ontario's Premier and Toronto's Mayor. The new team will start playing in 2026. This weather update is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Regina, proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. And our weather specialist Ethan Williams joins me now. This weather is having an impact on seeding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, farmers getting out into the fields now uh, and in some cases uh, getting th those uh, those fields planted. In other cases, uh, being hindered a little bit by the rain that we've been seeing. Uh, latest crop report up to uh, just a couple of days ago now on May 20th reporting just over half the crop is in the ground. That is, though, behind the five-year average of about uh, three quarters of crop in the field. Uh, we now also know that some uh, crop that was seeded a bit earlier is starting to pop up now 
and of course that's been aided by some of that rain uh, that we've seen. Uh, a stark contrast to last year, of course, because this is a look at uh, topsoil conditions for the period, same period in the crop report last year, and you can see kind of pockets of orange and maybe even a little bit of red in here, but as I step out of the way and I show you the uh, topsoil conditions for this crop report, you can see the major difference there. All of south and central Saskatchewan uh, seeing uh, pretty much adequate conditions and even some pockets of surplus moisture on the ground. So where we are right now is really not too bad. Even still, the uh, drought monitor as of the end of April shows that most of us in the province are seeing anywhere from moderate to extreme drought. Keep in mind, though, this does not take into account the moisture that we've seen in the month of May. So probably when the May drought report comes in, there will be some significant improvement in parts of the province. And we are seeing rain still today through a good uh, chunk of south and central Saskatchewan, especially in western sections, some pop-up showers and a little bit just popping up to the north of Regina uh, too. That going to continue over these next couple of days. Some showers possible in western sections overnight tonight as south and central starts to see a little bit of clearing. Another night in eastern sections of the Churchill region where some showers may turn over to snow flurries, Pelican Narrows, LaRange areas especially. Tomorrow it's the threat of showers and non-severe thunderstorms, especially in the western half of south and central. And then as we get into Saturday, things start to clear out a bit uh, as this low pressure system in Manitoba could be bringing through some uh, higher amounts of rain into southeastern Saskatchewan. Sunday uh, is the next best chance for widespread rain in southern Saskatchewan as central and northern portions of the province stay kind of partly cloudy. But still, over these next couple of days here, winds relatively light for many of us. It's that southeastern part of the province as that low moves through Manitoba where we could see winds pick up a little bit here and there. For Regina, it is a mix of sun and cloud with a chance of showers again tomorrow. That'll seem pretty familiar to us. It's what we've had these past few days anyway. Saturday is uh, probably looking like the best day of the weekend before those showers move in again on Sunday and then temperatures rapidly improving for the beginning of next week with mid 20s for Saskatoon. Similar forecast here. I think a little bit more cloud cover though for you tomorrow with the chance of non severe storms upper teens as we head through the rest of the weekend and those 20s for next week and even some temperatures overnight Sam getting into the double digits. Nice. Thanks Ethan. You're welcome. Some four-legged friends are again being enlisted to help control the invasive weed population around Regina's Wascana Center. The Provincial Capital Commission once again releasing goats trained to nibble through invasive weeds. Each goat eats about 10 pounds of weeds daily. You are welcome to watch these guys work, but you're asked to avoid the electric fences and keep your dogs on a leash. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. The U.S. Justice Department has launched an antitrust lawsuit against Ticketmaster. It and its parents' company, Live Nation, are accused of establishing an illegal monopoly in the music concert business. Our complaint makes clear what happens when a monopolist dedicates its resources to entrenching its monopoly power and insulating itself from competition rather than investing in better products and services. The U.S. Attorney General says it has led to higher costs for fans, fewer opportunities for artists, and the end of business for many small promoters. Live Nation called the allegations baseless. Ticketmaster owns or controls more than 265 concert venues in North America. Hurricane season officially begins next week on June 1st and runs until the end of November. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is predicting an exceptionally active season. This season is looking to be an extraordinary one in a number of ways based on our data and models with the El Nino La Nina playing out. Near record warm ocean temperatures will power some fierce weather in the Atlantic. 17 to 25 named storms are predicted, the most ever forecast. As many as 13 hurricanes are anticipated and several will be major. Last year's season was one of the most active on record with 20 named storms and three major hurricanes. Here at home, the Canadian Hurricane Center is predicting an active storm season off the East Coast. Canadian waters typically see about 35% of the storms that form in the Atlantic.
And Ethan is back with one last look at your weather, and it is not that dramatic. No, thankfully, one thing we don't have to deal with uh, here, but we will uh, possibly be dealing with a little bit of rain overnight in some parts of the province. For Regina, it's just partly cloudy skies, a temperature of 7 degrees, and fog again possible in our area. That should burn off tomorrow morning as te the temperature jumps by a degree by uh, 8 a.m. under partly cloudy skies. And uh, by the afternoon, there is the chance of a shower uh, as we head uh, into those afternoon hours. For Saskatoon, uh, again, similar picture here with uh, partly cloudy skies. A little bit more cloud cover, I think, though, for you folks by the morning as we see uh, also a temperature at 8 degrees. And then heading into the noon hour, that's when we do see that chance of uh, some showers and non-severe thunderstorms before things finally clear out for our weekend, Sam. All right. Thanks, Ethan. You're welcome. And before we leave you tonight, something to make you smile. Only 50 people are chosen from around the world for the Braille Challenge Finals. And a 10-year-old Martinsville boy is one of them. The first ever from Saskatchewan. He was tested on spelling, proofreading and speed. And his whole family was floored when they got the call. We just thought, oh, he's a top 10 in Canada. Exciting. And she said, no, he's not the top 10 in Canada. He's actually the top 10 internationally. This includes all of Canada, all of the U.S., all of Australia, and all of the U.K. Just to compete in a Braille challenge, it's an opportunity that's really fun. And to get there, like, it took me a long time to learn a lot of the symbols in Braille. Nobody had ever qualified from Saskatchewan before, so um, Isaiah was the very first. It's fun to challenge yourself to see like how you rank, and if you don't rank as high, it's, it's good to know that, and you should push yourself even harder, and it's fun to try and see, like, do I need to push myself even harder? I think around Saskatchewan and just around anywhere, they should have Braille everywhere because it's print. It's a different language, but it's print for blind people. So like also when I go to like some place or like a restaurant or something and I, and I have to go to the washroom, I always check the washroom signs to see if there's Braille on them. And if there is, I'm like, let's go. When he was little, a lot of um, people would say, Oh, I don't know how you deal with it. Oh, you must be meant to, you know, do this because I'd never be able to handle it or you're really going to have a lot of challenges and sufferings in your life. I, I feel very privileged to be his mom and uh, he is just such an amazing kid. To anyone who maybe can't see or can't walk who's watching, just because maybe you can't do something somebody else can doesn't mean you should give up on your dreams because that's how was for me and it should be like that for everyone else and I think it can be. And we'll be cheering for him when he goes to compete in California in June. That is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel or download the CBC News app. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.